This morning's scripture reading will come from Acts 11, 19 through 21. Acts 11, 19 through 21. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled through Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenist, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Well, it's good to see everybody here today. Hope that you are doing well. And I uh, hope you have your Bibles, and I want you to have them there to Acts 11. And that will be the primary text for our lesson today. In just a minute, we'll have our invitation song, Who Will Follow Jesus? I think this is going to be the last lesson in this series. This series has gone on for several weeks, talking about the church that acts like the church in Acts. And my whole premise behind this series, I just want to lay out the simplicity of New Testament Christianity. To, you know, to a lot of people, religion is confusing and frustrating and difficult. And to, you know, to some, there's even the idea that there's only a certain class of people in the world that get it. And then that class has the responsibility of, I guess, relaying it to the rest of us. It's the, it's the clergy laity system that, that really exists predominantly in denominationalism, and it shouldn't exist at all. But it does, and I'm, I'm afraid sometimes that it may exist in the Lord's church too. You've heard me say things along this line before. Uh, if you depend on me to know the Bible for you, you've got it wrong. Now, I am a preacher, obviously. Uh, that, that is what I do. But I can't learn the Bible for you. And I certainly can't do for you today what we're going to talk about, that every Christian has responsibility to do. This is on all of us. And, and really everything we've talked about, you know, we've, so last Sunday we talked about the malevolence that we find in the book of Acts, that intentional ill will and viciousness that some people have towards other people. We've talked about the joy that we find in the book of Acts. So many things we've looked at, the persecution, the boldness of the Christians in Acts, the salvation that's preached in Acts. All of those things touch us, but this one I'm going to talk about today is something that we all have responsibility for and we all are capable of doing. So we'll just run over this again and then we'll get started. Acts is a historical account. And as I was looking at this again last night, I didn't change my PowerPoint, but that should say Acts is the historical account. And it's not just the historical account, it's the inspired historical account of the establishment of Christ's church and then it, in Jerusalem, and then it's growth from there to Judea, into Samaria, and then to, and to the ends of the earth, according to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. That's what Jesus told his disciples just before he ascended. And so, sometime then between Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus promised to build his church, and Acts 2, 47, when people were being added to the church, obviously then the church was established. We know that. We, I mean, we've talked about this repeatedly for the last several weeks in making that single point. And so today we want to be the church that acts like the church in Acts. This is our history. In fact, that was one of the lessons we talked about from Acts chapter 7. Stephen laying out history that led from going all the way back to Abraham to his day and what happened with Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. Christianity is not difficult. It's not complicated. Knowing God's will is not difficult. God's will is not complicated. Now, that doesn't mean there are not difficult things and difficult passages. We understand that. I'm not talking about that. What we are talking about is that, well, I think, of, I think one verse that comes to my mind is 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. The, King James says, the New King James says burdensome. The King James says they're not grievous. It is not too hard to do what God expects us to do. He's not given us the impossible. And so, I want to be like the church in Acts. Because this is where we find, this is its origin. This is where it began. This is what it looked like in its, uh, in its purity before 
the, b- before the departures into the faith of Roman Catholicism and Protestant denominationalism that we are inundated with today. And we've talked about that to some extent too throughout this series. The, the multiplicity of churches, of names, of practices, of worship styles, of messages about salvation. I mean, that stuff's just all around us. The New Testament is not, it's not complicated like that. It's not contradictory like that. You can go to one church today. You can go to one church and hear one thing about, well, here's what you need to do in order to be saved. You can go to a second church and hear something different. And you can go to a church, third, a third church, and hear something else different. That's not how it's to be. That's not the, the way that God has set it up. So let's talk about proclaiming the word in Acts. And we're here in Acts chapter 11. And so the Christians have been scattered. Uh, you look, at, look here at Acts chapter 11 and verse 19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. Now take your Bibles back real quick to Acts chapter 8. Look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, if you remember, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 tells us, these are some of Jesus' last words before he left the earth. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That is happening right here because of the persecution. That's what God said would happen, and this is it being fulfilled because of this persecution. And so then you have verse uh, 4, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And so we have this map here, Jerusalem being down here by the, well, a little bit west of the Dead Sea. But you see the, the bigger, darker words here of Judea and Samaria. So the gospel starts here in Jerusalem, and it starts traveling north. Because of the persecution. This is what God said would happen. It would begin here. And it would progress. But now we're in Acts chapter 11. So I'm going to take my Bible back there. And it talks about those who were scattered. Verse 19. But then it says. They traveled as far as. uh, The King James says Phoenice. It's Phoenicia. And Cyprus. And Antioch. So now not only does it go further north to Antioch, but now you go a little bit west to Cyprus, this island here, and Cilicia, and of course, ultimately, it goes all the way to Rome with, by the hands of the Apostle Paul. And actually, it got to Rome before Paul ever got there because he wrote a letter to the church at Rome saying, I want to come see you, and he had plans to make it there. So you have this scattering, and you have, while the scattering is going on, again, look at Acts 11 and verse 19, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. And then we get into our points. So let's do this. Let's look at our, I've got uh, six points that I want us to consider from Acts chapter 11 verses 19 through 26. And these all are so important for us to get and some good lessons for us to learn. Number one, as you have this text here, we see that as they went, they were preaching the word. And I want to point something out to you here because you have this phrase in verse 19, but you also have it in verse 20. So look at it again. Verse 19 um, it talks about Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, and then it says preaching the word. OK, and then you get down to verse 20 and it says some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which uh, when they were come to Antioch, spake the word of the Lord to the Grecians or spoke to them, as it says. What I want to point out here is in one verse, you have this word preaching in our English Bibles. And in verse 20, you have the word spoke or spake, depending on what version you're looking at. It's the same word in the Greek language. The the word is laleo and it's a verb and it means the, the definition is interesting because it means to utter or to emit sound with the voice. So, you know, we've talked about this. You've heard me talk about this, too. The idea that some people have of, well, you know, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Right. You've heard people say that. 
And I get, I understand the necessity. Obviously, there are multiple passages talking. I mean, Jesus himself, you're the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Let men see your good works that they may glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's a kind of a summation of Matthew 5, 13 through 16. So I'm not questioning the necessity of, of living good lives and being salt and light, set an example by your manner of life. There's no question about that. But when it comes to living the Christian life and when it comes to being the church that acts like the church in Acts, we have to emit some sound with our voice. You can't tell anyone how to become a Christian without telling them how to become a Christian. Yes, you can live a good life. Yes, you can set the example. You can lead them to worship. You can show them what's... You, you can do all of that. But if a person never hears the word of God come out of your mouth, how will they ever know what to do to be saved? So we just did the Fulton County Gospel News Wednesday night. And of course, we, we send about 6,300 copies all over the United States. We hit 49 of the 50 states. I still can't... We still don't send one to Maine. I need to rectify that. But anyway, now we do this local paper. And there's some... Incidentally, there are some local Fulton County Gospel News on the back table. They go to every hand carry route, every post office box. If you live in 72554, you get one of these. The church got one. Anyway, on the inside of this page this month, one thing that I did, I didn't write an article. I put some advertisements for our local community of different Bible study methods that we offer here. People in this community may know your name. They may know where you live. They may work with you. You may be friends. You may be related to them. But they need to hear something emitted from your mouth if they're going to ever become a Christian. While it is absolutely necessary to be salt and light, to live, um, to live as children of God, to set the proper example, if we don't emit some noise from our mouth about it, they will never know what to do. There are, there are so many tools that we have at our disposal, and we'd better get to using them. We have that responsibility. So you see here then, so I've looked at verses 19 and 20. So verse 19 says, preaching the word. Verse 20 says, they spoke to the Hellenists or to the Grecians. But then look at the, the rest of verse 20 here, uh, the end of verse 20. Uh, they spake to the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, this is a different word in the Greek language. This is euangelizo. This is bringing good news. So they spoke. They emitted noise with their mouth. They emitted noise, verses 19 and 20. But then it gets very specific. They talked to them about the good news. That's the gospel. We're told what they did, and we're told how they did it. We have to emit some sound out of our mouth about the gospel. Well... So they did that. Look at verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So let me ask you a question. What? So we're, we're going on vacation next month. Up northeast. And we did some research. You know, every time we get ready to go, we look for a congregation near where we're going. And uh, Gail found one. <laughs> and uh, we won't be going to that one. There was one Church of Christ in that region, and it said sometimes we use music, sometimes we don't. It, apparently you just kind of, as we say, fly by the seat of your pants, and however you feel one day you do, and however you feel the next you do. What I'm, what I'm getting at, when you think of a church, you're going somewhere. What do you look for? What does it mean to be a sound congregation? You ever thought about that? Well, sound. Uh, I know the preacher. Well, that could, be, that could be helpful. Know who the preacher is and what kind of person he is and his, perhaps his, uh, I guess you kind of say his resume, what he's done throughout the years. Well, but that's not always because you may find a congregation somewhere you're going and you don't know who the preacher is. Well, then what? Well, the building says Church of Christ. So what? I can tell you a lot of stories about buildings that say something that are not churches of Christ. And what I mean by churches of Christ, I'm not using that in the, in the denominational title sense. 
I'm using it as a descriptor because that's what it is. A church of Christ. It belongs to Christ. Just because you have a sign on your building outside or a sign on a road somewhere that says, so-and-so Church of Christ, three miles, doesn't make that group of Christ. What makes a church sound? Well, when I'm looking here, the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. One thing that makes a church sound is their evangelism. What are they doing in their local community? You know, a congregation can have a strong pulpit, can have strong classrooms, and be as unsound as a congregation that does things that are completely unscriptural. If we sit inside our building four days, four, what, four hours out of a 168-hour week, and we worship God faithfully, and we, do, we, you know, we tick all the right boxes, as we say, but we never get out in our community, can we call ourselves a sound congregation? Can we call it, so forget congregationally, what about individually? If we show up individually at this building, every time the doors are open, and we, again, we check all the boxes, we, we do things that, that are in fact laid out for us in the pages of the New Testament, but then we never emit a sound from our mouth outside of that, are we truly a faithful Christian? The answer to that is no. You're neither a faithful Christian and nor would we be a sound congregation if that were the case. So you see these people, again, verse 19, preaching, speaking, emitting a sound, speaking, verse 20, emitting a sound, and good newsing. That's, that's really one way to say it, preaching, evangelizing. And what's the result of that, verse 21? God was with them. If we're not fulfilling our role in this community as, as a unit or as individuals, will God be with us? The obvious answer is no. There's so much more to Christianity than showing up at a building. And I think, I think in our culture, with all the options we have in different religions and different practices and beliefs, we've simplified it to such an extent that showing up at a building, that is the, that is the, um, the determiner of my faithfulness. And that's not the case with the New Testament church with a sound congregation, because the hand of the Lord was with them, and we know what they were doing. And what's the result of the Lord being with them? A great number believed and turned unto the Lord. There are still people out there who are looking for the truth. And if you have the truth, that you never speak it outside of these walls to people, nobody's going to be turned to the Lord, the church isn't going to grow, and God's not going to be with us. Those are the results of doing what God would have us to do. And if we're going to be a church that acts like the church in Acts, like this historical figure, this historical example that we have for us in Scripture, we need to be proclaiming the word in our community. Period. I mean, if we're not, we're not a sound congregation. I don't care how many articles are written or how many missionaries we support or a gospel meeting we have. If we're not doing what we're supposed to do in all ways, we're not faithful. We're not sound. The word sound, by the way... All that word means, and it's a biblical term, and it's used many times. The word sound simply means healthy. That's the, name, that's the meaning of that term in the Greek language. A healthy congregation, a vibrant congregation, is doing things as a body, like we are right now. It is doing things properly and scripturally, but it is also doing things as individuals in the community faithfully. And God will be with us, and the church will grow. Then we come upon this guy by the name of Barnabas in our text. So pick up in verse 22. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. You remember the map? Antioch's north of Jerusalem. Quite a ways. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God. That's an interesting phrase. He saw the grace of God. Well, the term grace in the Greek language is charis and it means favor. He saw God's favor. What does that mean? Well, verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. Barnabas, it was visible that God was working with these people. Uh, he was glad and he exhorted. That's a good thing to see, a congregation that's vibrant and active 
and growing. But you know what? It also needs to be exhorted. You don't stop. You can't, keep, you, uh, you can't quit. There's not a point in your Christian walk, either individually or congregationally, where we say, okay, we've reached it. We've done, we've done our part here. We're just going to exist. We're going to pay the bills. And we'll be here. People will know where we are. I mean, we've got a building. We've got signs everywhere. Sometimes Christianity is treated that way. He exhorted them all, what? That with, with, that with purpose of heart, intention. They have intentionally decided to do something. They have, the, the Greek term means to set before. To continue with the Lord. To remain in. To keep on. It's not just, you know, there's a temptation sometimes to talk about the good old days. And how good it was. 20 years ago or 40 years ago or 60. Well, guess what? That's great. We don't live 20 years ago. We are, we are here. We are now. Maybe what we should be thinking about instead of how good it was 30 years ago, where will we be in 30 years as a congregation? I thought it would be interesting as I was putting this together and thinking about this particular point, encouraging, you know, setting before to, to remain in the Lord. It, it would be interesting to me, and I may still do this, if y'all would maybe be anonymous, let's average our age. Everybody submit what your current age is, and let's see the average age of our congregation. And where will it be in 30 years? 20 years even. Something to think about, because oftentimes we do get caught up in how good it used to be. Barnabas Saul was glad and encouraged them. People were continued. Notice verse 24. People continued to be added to the Lord. He, Barnabas, was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and much people, the King James says, was added to the Lord. Many people were added to the Lord, we might say today. A great, in fact, the New King James says, a great many people were added to the Lord. And that's, what, that's the way you see it, incidentally, in the New Testament. Beginning there in Acts chapter 2, of course, you have the 3,000 who uh, gladly received His Word and were baptized, Acts 2 and verse 41. And then you go to Acts 4 and verse 4, and the number of the disciples multiplied. You go to Acts chapter 5, and they continue to multiply. You get to Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, and it says a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. The growth is not, hey, we had one baptism this year. We had two baptisms last year. They were multiplying. Why were they multiplying? Well, because they were busy doing what God had, would have them to do. They were faithful in that. They were, as it says there in verse 23, they had pur purpose of heart in doing that. And then you have verse 21, the hand of the Lord was with them. It is no different today. Do, do we think some, for some reason that now that we're not in the first century and we don't see the miracles that were being performed, that somehow God is not with us anymore? That we're just here kind of flailing along and hoping things go well? Well, no, of course not. God is still active, so far as I can tell from Scripture. He's never quit. Maybe we have. People continue to be added to the Lord. You get down to verse 25. Then, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves together with the church. Now there's your, what I would say is what we're doing right now. They assembled together with the church. That's necessary, obviously. And taught much people. Are we doing that? Are we teaching much people in our community? And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So I want to look at this word called for just a minute, and then we'll wrap the lesson up. This word called in the Greek language is used quite often in the New Testament. I forget how many times, but the Greek term is krematizo, and it means every time it's used in the New Testament, it's a divine calling. Every time. So just for instance, in Matthew chapter 2, Joseph was warned by God in a dream. Same word called or warned. Acts chapter 10 and verse 22. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7. The, these people who are being either warned or called, it's the same word and it's a call from God. And so the disciples were divinely called Christians first at Antioch. Some people say, well, people called them Christians trying to make fun of them. And that's absolutely wrong. They were called by God as Christians, followers of Christ. Because that's what they were. That's what they were doing. That's who they were imitating. But in that process, 
through everything we've looked at so far, and not only today, but again, this whole series of lessons, people were being taught. And you know, I talk about, I've, so I've talked about this today, obviously. People were being added. The number was being multiplied. But here's the thing. Not everybody who was taught, not everybody who heard the word, believed it. And certainly not everybody who, who heard the word obeyed it. We know that. There's no question about that. I mean, you just turn a couple of pages to Acts chapter 13 when Paul and Barnabas are preaching. They're rejected by a large number of people. And that happens many times in the book of Acts. But here's the thing. They still were teaching. And as they were teaching, people were being added to the Lord. That's how it works. So I'll go back to, and I guess I'll finish here. It is not enough. It, it, it is absolutely essential to be salt and light. Not questioning that. It is absolutely essential for people to, again, as Matthew 5.16 says, to see your good works so that they can glorify your Father in heaven. Not questioning that at all. But what I am questioning is, are we speaking? Are we emitting sound with our mouth? Because if we are not, then we're not doing enough. And we're all capable of doing that. The way I've said it before, if you know what you did to become a Christian, you can tell somebody else. It's not that hard. You just have to do it. If you know what you did, you can tell somebody else what they need to do. And like I said, we've got all kinds of tools. We've got all kinds of, of, of tools at our disposal. We've got people that will help. But we've got to be about it. It's not, the, the church doesn't grow by accident. Okay? The church doesn't grow... Uh, it's not an, whoops, look, somebody became a Christian today. This is intentional. That's why Barnabas encouraged them that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. That's talking about people who are already Christians, but we have work to do. And if we're going to be like, if we're going to be the church that acts like the church in Acts, then we, this is part of what we need to be doing. And that is proclaiming the word like they did in Acts. So, again, I hope this series of lessons has been beneficial to you, maybe opened up some, some thoughts with you that you hadn't had before from the book of Acts. There's so much in there. There's no question about that. But I've tried to be very practical with these things and, and tried to be encouraging and get us to see what's going on there so we know what needs to be going on now. Because that's the model for us. That's the pattern. That's the church that, that, that was the apostolic church. Established under their guidance by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And, and you and I, we should be doing the same things today. We can be that, we can be just like them. We may look different cosmetically. We've got a building, we've got pews, big deal. We can still look like the church in Acts. And that's what I think God would have us to do. Because His hand was with them. Acts chapter 11 verse 21. It may be that there's somebody here today who is not yet a member of that church. Like I said today, you have, man, you have all kinds of options. You can go to this group or the group down the road or the group a little farther down the road and you'll hear three different messages. Yet you turn to the Bible and you'll find one. You find it right there on the day the church itself was established. Men and brethren, what must we do? Peter's response was, you need to repent and every one of you needs to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If you want remission of sins today, you need to do the same thing that they did then. It, that's not changed. We're here to help you in that effort. Maybe you have questions about that. Maybe you know when you're ready. We are here for you. We will do whatever we can to help you in that process. It may be the case that there's somebody here this morning who's done that in the past and yet not remained faithful to the gospel and ultimately to Christ. Well, today you can be restored. You can come back. And like Barnabas told those people, with purpose of heart, you need to continue with the Lord. If you need to respond to the gospel in either way today, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.